Lecture number three for chapter 22, we're going to move down into the larynx and the trachea. If my computer will wake up here. Come on. There we go. Okay, so this is a diagram from your textbook, which is showing the features of the larynx. And it is larynx, not larynx. And um, the division line between the laryngopharynx, which is part of your upper respiratory tract, and the larynx down in here is this flap. This is called the epiglottis, which is composed of connective tissues. You have an epithelial tissue lining and you have some cartilage in there as well. And that's a little flap that closes over the top of the larynx right here when you're swallowing food and water so that that food and water does not move this way down into the larynx. Okay, and there are a lot of, you have lots of cartilage tissue, hyaline cartilage, that um, exists in rings and other types of structures around the trachea down in here and then also around the larynx but you can feel that if you feel your uh, Adam's apple you're actually feeling the cartilages that exist around the larynx and now you don't have to learn the names of these cartilages and muscles that you see here on the larynx but they're important in giving that structure its consistency and also up here at the very top of the larynx, this is where you have your vocal fo folds, or also known as your true vocal cords. Okay, so your vocal ligaments, what are these? Um, what they do is they actually attach some of the cartilages uh, to each other up there at the top of the larynx. They have lots of elastic fibers in them which means they have a lot of elasticity, so if they get stretched, they rebound into place very quickly. And these vocal ligaments, these tissues, form the core of what are called your vocal folds, or true vocal cords. There's another term you need to be familiar with, and that is glottis. The glottis includes your true vocal cords and the opening between them. All right, so when air is passing down into the larynx, from the laryngopharynx, it has to go through that opening. So the vocal cords will be open, you have a space in between them, and those two things together are referred to as the glottis. And that space has to be open as well as you make sounds, these uh, vocal folds or true vocal cords, these very elastic fibers that you have in there, vibrate, and that is what actually produces sound as you push air through um, that opening as it's coming up from from the lungs. So here's a diagram from your textbook that is showing this. So this is when you're, if you were looking down into somebody's throat, here's the base of the tongue. And um, here's the uh, that flap that you see, and this is kind of an unusual view. So this is actually supposed to be the epiglottis right here, even though you're looking down on top of it, so you can't really tell that it's a flap. But looking down in there, from there, you have some softer tissues here on either side. And those are called uh, vestibular folds or false vocal cords. So they're not really involved in sound production, but they're next to your true vocal cords, which are these very elastic type tissues that you have here. And again, you can see they're joining cartilages. You've got a cartilage right here called the cuneiform cartilage that is connected to... Uh, those true vocal cords. And when they're open over here, your true vocal cords and that space in between them is called the glottis. The reason the epiglottis is called the epiglottis, epi means over, so it actually covers or it lies over the glottis when you are swallowing um, food or water. Okay, so when you, you know, what's involved in voice production, we're not going to get into a lot of the gory details here, but when you're speaking any kind of speech, you have intermittent release of expired air. I get used to a couple of new terms as well. Inspiration is breathing in. Expiration is breathing out. So there are really other terms for inhalation and exhalation. That's important to know because that terminology is used a lot with respiratory physiology. Alright, so uh, 
expired air or exhaled air passing through that opening between your true vocal cords intermittently leads to speech. Pitch changes in pitch. The length and the tension of the vocal cords changes and that makes your voice high pitched or low pitched. Uh, gender differences. Uh, males have a larger larynx. They're going to have larger true vocal cords and so that affects the pitch. That's why most, most males have a deeper pitched voice than your average female. Loudness, this is not a surprise. The force of the, of the air that you're forcing through those vocal cords affects the loudness. Um, and then the sounds of your voice, uh, the way it sounds also affected by the pharynx, your oral cavity, nasal cavity, and even those sinus cavities that you have inside your facial and cranial bones. Those help amplify the sound and change the sound quality. And again, you can know that that's true, at least with your nasal cavity, because when you hold your nose, the sounds coming out sound different. And as far as speech and making different, um, different speech patterns and sounds and so forth, that gets uh, your tongue muscles involved and other muscles in the pharynx and around your soft palate and your lips as well, as you guys know. All right, so moving down from there into the trachea. So your larynx is up here and it's surrounded by these cartilages, these larger cartilages. And as you move down lower, you get into the trachea, which has bands of hyaline cartilage around it, those tracheal rings. So if you were looking at the, uh, the trachea, and this is the esophagus back here. So anterior, the trachea is anterior to the esophagus. The esophagus is a more muscular um, and thinner passageway for food and water that's sitting behind or posterior to the trachea. But if you looked at it in a cross section, you have the mucosa, the respiratory mucosal membrane or mucous membrane. That's epithelial tissue, that little brown line that you see there. It's a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium and those little hairs there brush mucus upward and away from the lower respiratory tract. We want clean air passing through this lumen, this space, down toward the lungs. And then you have an area called the submucosa, consisting of connective tissues with lots of these seromucous glands that produce large amounts of mucus. Sits up here along these little hairs, these little cilia, and helps trap dust and particles and microorganisms and so forth before they make their way down down here into the lungs. Doesn't always work, but um, uh, most of the time it does. And then you do have these hyaline cartilage rings along the trachea as part of the tracheal wall as well that helps protect the trachea. Your trachea is kind of important. You don't want it getting crushed or closing very easily so that helps hold it open. This term adventitia, that's referring to a connective tissue coating around the outside of the trachea. So you might run into that term more than once when you have an adventitia, that's what that's referring to, kind of a tough connective tissue covering around the outside of an organ. Okay, so this is, uh, if you were actually looking at the uh, a slice through the wall of the trachea in a cross section and this would represent your lumen over here where you have air and right in here that's your epithelial lining where you have the pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells hopefully you remember some of that from biology 201 there's the little cilia so they're going to trap things like dust particles and bacteria that are moving down in there. Now just deep to that within the wall, you're still in the wall of the trachea. We're looking at things on a very mic microscopic level. This is where you have um, what's called the submucosa down in here. And a lot of what you're seeing here are the seromucous glands. Anywhere you're seeing a dark purple spot, that's the nucleus of a cell. So like right in there you're seeing you, the blade that may cut this tissue cut through the um, those uh, seromucous glands that produce a lot of the mucus and squirt it out here onto the uh, 
the mucosal lining. And if you keep going deeper, you know, from you're, we're moving from inside the trachea here to where the outside, over in here you have hyaline cartilage. Maybe that looks a little bit familiar to you when you were studying what tissues look like. Looks like back in biology 201. Okay, so we're now going to be moving on in lecture four down into the lungs and we're going to talk about a really important feature down in the lungs called the respiratory membrane because that's where you are exchanging your O2 and your carbon dioxide between the blood and the air that the hopefully clean air that has made its way down into the deep structures of the lungs. So that's what we'll talk about in lecture number four.